Hello, friends, and welcome to another edition of Syracuse Sports presented by Krause Health, the exclusive healthcare partner for SU Athletics. Brent Axe, Emily Liker back with you as spring football rolls around. We got a scrimmage in the books. We've got some recruits to talk about. We met a new coach today. We got real injury information to provide to you. I mean, what a time to be alive, Emily, a head coach actually telling us what's going on with injured football players today. I almost... I almost fainted at the real information <laughs> we were provided by Fran Brown today. Yeah, you know, we heard two major updates. Obviously, we see things in practice and then we have to wait to um, talk and kind of hear what's going on. And um, both major players here, obviously, Rondé Gadsden and then and Jackson Meeks. I will say, like, Rondé Gadsden's was pretty much expected. Mm -hmm. um, we knew that he was likely going to have a second surgery this spring. It was optional for him to get those screws removed from his foot. At least that's what his dad had told me back in February. Clearly that's what he and, and his training staff and recovery staff chose to do. And so um, I had noted last week at practice that he wasn't there on Thursday. And at the time the, uh, the sports information director hadn't known why. And that seems to be, it's because he was down getting his screws out. So no surprise there. Um, that shouldn't affect his like recovery timeline in any major way. He's still set to be on pace for a uh, full go in, in the summer and, and being really back to 100% health and performance by the opening of fall camp, which will be in August. Um, Meeks, obviously, we did not know about, and that, that was a newer thing that we heard from, from Brown today. He was in a boot on his, which foot was it, Brent? His left better foot. Than I did. Yeah. His left foot. So opposite foot of Gadsden. Gadsden is right foot. Meeks is left foot. Um, sounds like it was something that he dealt with at Georgia, um, I believe Brown said, and they maybe just didn't know how serious it was. And when they found out that it was a, a hairline fracture, they're like, Brown's like, nope, we're getting that fixed and, and you're going to be full go. So I think he said about four weeks before yep. Meeks is ready to go and, and do stuff again. So you can find a little bit more detail about both of those on, on the website. There you go. So check that out at Syracuse.com. We're going to hear from Fran Brown and edge coach Nick Williams, also noted as uh, one of the top recruiters in the country coming up. And what was not only the honesty, Emily, to hear Fran Brown say the words, uh, hairline fracture, foot surgery, like specifics. Why hold that back? Like you got a guy, he's going to be out for a month. It's an injury that persisted from last year. So it may have been out there from people that knew Meeks at Georgia. And what stood out to me is Meeks through camp, as Fran Brown described, is like, I'm good coach, I'm good coach. But they finally said, no, let's shut this down. Let's take care of it now and get through it. And even through that injury, Emily, we've talked about him a few times. Jackson Meeks has looked great in camp. He stood out in camp. So get that taken care of. Let's see what he's at at 100% as opposed to out there playing with a, a nagging injury in his foot. And the approach that Brown said about not only that, but with OG, right? You know, I asked, is it veteran maintenance? Are you taking it easy with him? He's like, no, we're, we're just, we wanted him to get him out there to focus on blocking in the spring but they are really taking it easy and being careful and cautious with OG's recovery. Remember that Liz Frank injury he suffered in September of last year. That's a 10 to 12 month full recovery for that thing. Right. So to hear the note, get the screws out and the process that's there, that's just something you don't want to mess with. But I've been surprised to see what OG's even been able to do uh, throughout camp. But certainly we now know how, how cautious they're being with that. Yeah, you know, he was he was pretty active those first um, few practices that he was involved in. And like you said, Brown said the big focus with him has been blocking. And, you know, that's kind of been the big focus for him since he moved into the tight end role. Obviously, having a background as a receiver, the receiving comes naturally, but the blocking doesn't. It's a whole different kind of ball game doing that for him. But it's also been a focus of, of the team, as we've talked about before. So I think this is the smart move for both of them, like, ultimately like yeah would it be great to have them in front of fans help rile up um excitement in in the spring game sure but i think people are excited enough and uh you want both of those guys 100 percent healthy and and as good to go as possible by the and, start of the actual season and what we continue to hear we'll confirm it as we get closer and just make sure here but the spring game is actually going to be about as close to a real scrimmage as you right. can get Speaking of which, Syracuse had its first of two inter-squad scrimmages on Saturday. You're going to hear Fran Brown talk about that coming up and some players that stood out. But another thing that stood out, Emily, was another flood of recruits 
coming in on unofficial visits and we could do entire shows and we will do recruiting shows coming up in the future here just to get a sense from recruiting experts and people that really follow this stuff closely you know the guys that Syracuse is in they're getting commitments from and they are well ahead of the game they are a top 10 recruited school in the country right now recruiting wise keep in mind you get credit for the number of recruits you have it's not just an evaluation of the recruits you have and Syracuse has correct me if I'm wrong Emily 12 commitments yeah I believe point. they're they're at 12 right now yeah for the class of 2025 which is well ahead of the game that I have seen in Syracuse in, in recent memory but there's a few names that did visit this weekend you see them kind of post on social media afterwards that I thought we should know number one was uh, Michael Thomas who's a four-star wide receiver from Tom's River New Jersey class of 2025 he's a 5'10 200 pound receiver and would be a big get for Syracuse another New Jersey recruit and a very talented player at that hardy watts was the other four star player that i saw post on social media six five 305 pound offensive lineman he's a four star guy he's rated the number one player overall in the state of massachusetts remember syracuse just got a running back commitment from massachusetts he's in the class of 2025 a few other guys that stood out to me keith mcdowell six five 345 pound offensive defensive lineman he's from medford new york so keeping it within new york state he's in the class of 2026 wears a size 18 shoe to tell you the the, the size that they're bringing in recruit wise emily here's another one another terrific uh, nickname by the way Laniel big u-haul hall Six four three forty, class of twenty twenty six. Another Massachusetts guy. He's from Brookline. I mean, we're we're really winning in the nickname department here, right? With not only future recruits, but a couple of guys that uh, have committed to Syracuse as well. Dion Wilson, uh, mm-hmm. the big tank, right? And some of these these great nicknames that we're seeing uh, on the team and, and recruiting wise. Yeah, you know, it's always interesting to see the different posts kind of roll in and, and who's around campus. Um, I think it's it's worth noting that not all of these guys are class of 2025 players. Like we've seen out to, I think you said you saw 2028. I saw the other 2028, day, yeah. Which is crazy. Uh, but so I see ninth it, grader, not, yeah. Yeah, that would be like freshman year. Um, but yeah, there's just really been a lot on campus uh, this spring. I caught up with Byron Washington, Marcus Upton, and Jordan Gibbs, who were three of those guys that visited that very first weekend of spring camp, the weekend that it snowed and was kind of gross here in central New York, and talk to them about that visit and and their commitments, which they kind of kicked off this wave of commitments that we've seen here early in the spring. So uh, you can read that on the site right yeah. now as well. Read that. And Byron Washington, of course, who's 6'8", 380, that famous right. viral photo out there of a poor young man he pushed around in the texas uh, state championship game so uh, check that out and you know we're tracking recruits as best as we can but emily it's that we need like someone to do that full time just to yeah. track the flood of visitors uh that that's coming in and that will continue through spring ball uh, i was also noted over the weekend i know you wrote about this there was a wide receiver from philadelphia whose name is escaping me at the moment um Give me a sec to look that up or if you remember Jaleel Hall Jaleel, Jaleel Hall, Hall thank you he put Syracuse in his top five now he is mm-hmm. going to announce in June he is visiting Syracuse in uh June 7th through 9th I remember the date that he is coming in and th- that's a that's a pretty big get for Syracuse if they can uh, get him uh if he does announce and commit to Syracuse in I believe June 29th is when he's announcing so starting to see Syracuse show up more and more in these four five-star big name recruits and he's from Philly so there's another regional within six hours uh type of player that you just weren't seeing Syracuse show up in those top five lists and now we're seeing happen more and more often definitely all right so that's uh on the recruiting front We're going to hear from Nick Williams coming up, who is not only noted as one of the top recruiters in the country, he is Syracuse's new edge coach and is working with that defensive line. Emily, you spent a lot of time at practice watching the defensive line today. What did you see? Yeah, you know, pretty basic drills today. Um, I I watched the the defensive tackle group and then the edge group. Um, So first, I guess I'll just lay out who is working in which, because that's always interesting to know. So defensive tackles who are working mainly with Robinson in practice, um, Elijah Fuentes Cundiff, who's obviously a returning guy, Richard Perry, that's a returning guy, Kevin Jobody Jr., Michael 
Nwokocha, I hope I'm saying that right, Jaleel Smith, Braylon Ingram, Ty Gordon, and Dion Wilson Jr. were all the guys I spotted over there today. Dion Wilson Jr., obviously, the tank, as you tank. just mentioned. Uh, big guy, big, big guy. So at that tackle position, that's what you want. Um, and then out on the edge, you have Jahai Lassane Jr., King Joseph Edwards. Those are two of the uh, brand new freshmen, and they actually got shout outs from Williams today. David Omopariola, Fidel Diggs, obviously, Chase Simmons, Dennis Jaquez, Stan Moto, who I believe is one of those walk ons that mm -hmm. joined practice um, or joined the team back when they had their winter walk on tryouts. Uh, Isaiah Hastings, who is the Alabama transfer, and then Kevin. Kevin Jobody Jr. must be doing work with both groups because I haven't written down twice, but that's not <laughs> that's not necessarily a surprise. Um, you see that. So, you know, the defensive tackles were working a lot today um, on like practicing, like getting double teamed. And so like at one point, like Robinson was yelling at him and was like, you got to be strong. You're going up against 600 pounds and stuff like that and had them <laughs> working, working the two man machine and then getting out, um, getting out of blocks and stuff like that. It was funny, too, at one point he was standing on the back of the machine as two guys pushed him. And I, I don't think he was quite ready for the first group to, to push him. They pushed him several yards back and he was kind of <laughs> like, Whoa, like, and hey surprised now. by how much they did. Um, and then similarly, the, the defensive, uh, the edge rusher guys were just kind of working around getting off blocks and, and getting around to, to the QB and stuff like that. It's again, like we're just seeing very basic positional skill work right now. So like, nothing too crazy about like who is lining up where besides like what groups they're practicing in. Um, but, but yeah, you know, it was, it was just pretty basic stuff. Um, both Elijah Robinson and, and Nick Williams are on the louder side as coaches. So they, they are very vocal and they, they yell a lot and get into it. Um, but one of the things we can talk about as, as we talk about quotes, I think that really stood out to me today. Uh, was hearing a little bit about Fidel Diggs and Nick Williams's relationship because obviously we know Fidel Diggs is close with Elijah Robinson. They have the Camden tie, they have the Texas A&M tie, but he's working with Williams mostly. And you know, Williams is overseeing this group a lot more off the field than Robinson necessarily is because mm -hmm. Robinson is the defensive coordinator. So uh, we heard a lot about that today, and I thought there's some interesting things to talk about there. There's two things that stand out. One is the name Fidel Dix keeps coming up and the impact that he is having. He is essentially the Kyle McCord of the defense, right? He's yes. that good of a player. He's that highly rated of a player. He's that talented of a player. And he is kind of the North star of that defense. He's helped guide some of these players, having the familiarity with coach Robinson. And it just sounds like he is the standout name on the defensive line who keeps breaking through, who keeps making plays. There was, uh, a situation that Nick Williams talked about today, Emily. I don't know if I caught the audio or not, but he was talking about there was three plays in a row where Fidel Diggs not only stood out and made plays, he was a lot of football jargon in there, but he did it in like three different ways. And he can mm -hmm. tell like the offensive line was just like overwhelmed by this. And one thing you're going to hear Fran Brown talk about when we play the, the, the sound bite coming up here is one thing he didn't like about the scrimmage on Saturday was they gave up a few too many sacks in his eyes. So you can yeah. tell Diggs is behind that. And this, this defensive line that brings me to the second point, Emily, a lot of new names in there, a lot of new mm -hmm. names working their way and not only transfers, but names that are kind of moving up the charts uh, from the depth chart as well. Yeah. That moment you mentioned, I have the quote from, from Nick Williams as he was describing um, that set of plays from Fidel. And so a little more context is I had asked like, Oh, what's the biggest focus with this edge group right now? And he said, you know, like, making sure we get back and, and disrupting the quarterback and doing all of that. And he had mentioned that uh, one thing coach Fran told him that's really stuck with him is like, essentially your guys, like the position, the guys in your position group are going to reflect like your personality as a mm -hmm. coach and like are going to become mini youth essentially. And so I was like, what's a moment from this spring where you've seen someone and been like, Oh, this guy, he's like emulating me now. And so, um, this is the quote from, from Nick Williams. He said, Fidel Diggs, he had three rushes back to back to back. It's called pass, pass rush math, which I thought was a fun little phrase there. You want to throw pitches like you're in a baseball game. One move, he rushed off the edge with speed and he beat the guy. The next move, he went speed to power and beat the guy. 
The very next move, he worked chop, spin, and countered inside. He worked three different moves, and it showed his toolbox, his versatility, and rushing the passer. That's kind of who I am. I like to teach the same things different ways for different guys to learn. And so then we got into, like, how do you balance that and, and just learning the different types of ways that your players learn best and operate and, and how you can teach them. And he obviously talked about getting to know them off the field is the big thing. But that idea of, like, pass rushing and mixing things up also came up with Fadil and he was like you know what like coming out of the scrimmage one thing I told the D linemen we need to get better at is like mixing up our pass rushes and how we are getting to getting into the backfield because you can't just go at it the same way over and over again so that that was a fun moment you always love as a reporter <laughs> when you're yes. asking questions and without like leading people places they kind of bring the story all together for you Definitely. and that was a yeah. that was a nice moment of that as a spider to a Y banana moment, as I like to call it, you know, you're watching Gruden's keep QB camp back in the day, get into that jargon. You're like, yes, football jargon. Mm -hmm. Love that stuff. That, but that was a good story. And that should lead us right into Nick Williams. Emily, we had a chance to speak with him for the first time today. And as you're going to hear, he is quite the storyteller. He's got a couple good ones here, but uh, one thing I wanted to start with here from Nick Williams is just how happy he is to be here at Syracuse. And it wasn't him that noticed, didn't it? was somebody else. My wife called me the other day, and she was like, you're having so much fun. You're so happy. I got my weight back. I'm, I'm eating good. Um, I'm so blessed and happy to be here. Uh, I work with a lot of great men, hard workers. Coach Fran is probably the hardest worker. Coach Fran and Coach Elijah, they're probably the hardest workers I've ever been around. So um, my work ethic is definitely improving. Um, there, it's late nights and early mornings. So uh, the only downfall is I don't get a chance to see my family, but they'll be moving up in June, my wife and my baby. So that's the only thing I look forward to. But in the meantime, I'm, learn I'm having a lot of fun. A lot of fun got cut off at the end there. But we learned another fun nugget from Nick Williams today, Emily. Coach Fran Brown actually requires his coaching staff yeah. to work out three days a week. Mm -hmm. They don't necessarily have to do it together, though some of them do it in the morning, some of them do it at other parts of the day when it's convenient. But from the top down, if we're going to set this example as coaches, we have to show it. And you heard Nick Williams talk about it there, joking around that his wife's pretty happy that he's uh, in, <laughs> in the weight room three, four days a week. Yeah. Yeah, no, that was definitely interesting. And he said that's the first time that a coach, a head coach has ever required his staff, a staff that he's been on to to do that. So that was interesting. You know, I kind of want to be like, hey, can we get out there at 530 a.m. with you and, and test out this this coach workout routine? I don't know if they all do their own thing or if they they have a set regimen they go through. I don't know if Chad Smith, the head athletic trainer, is involved or, or what's going on there. When you say we, I don't know who the other person in this conversation <laughs> is because you're not getting me out there at 530 in the morning. I can tell you that. Nick Williams noted as one of the top 25 recruiters in the country. I asked him about his uh, philosophy about recruiting. Here's what he said. Building organic, realistic relationships. Just being real. Uh, these young boys, they know the difference from real and fake. And I'm just myself. Um, I'm around two of the best, if not the best in the country. And Coach Ian, Coach Fran, and um, a lot of great recruiters on the offensive side. And I kind of learned from those guys. But I'm just myself. You know, most of the time, more times than not, the guys like me. We listen to the same music. We speak the same language. Um, I'm only 33, so uh, I don't think I'm too old. You know, I'm kind of still young. I feel young. Um, Coach Fran makes us work out three times a week, which I love. So I'm in the weight room, and I kind of keep that energy going. The kids like high motor, high energy guys. You know, how am I asking my guys to run to the ball and I'm not running to the ball? That just doesn't make sense to me. So... I just, I try to build organic relationship. That really matters. You know, I like my daughter's 18 and there's certain things we connect on. She actually listens to a lot of the same music that I do, even though we're generations apart. Yet there are other things when I talk to her, I feel like that Steve Buscemi meme. It's like, hello, young kids. What are you up to? Right. Nick is 33. He said it, speaks the same language, listens to the same music. You make that connection right away. And it's genuine, Emily. It's not just like, mm -hmm. oh, yes, I hear the Drake is great music, kids. Like he he probably listens to the same music that they're listening to and can speak right to them. And when you say you, you got to be real with these guys, right? That's half the battle right there. You have to know what they're talking about and how to talk to them about it. Right. And, you know, it, it's it's worth noting as we talk about the D line and about recruiting, Nick Williams was one of the guys who had a major hand in getting King Joseph Edwards up here. Um, 
and I mean, he was just one of the most talked about recruits in that 2024 class and, and a big get for them. So he, he's, he's a talent and, you know, I think he's gonna, he's one of those guys that like coach Robinson is probably only going to be here a couple of years and then get to land somewhere else in a, in a bigger role. And so it'll be exciting to see kind of that progression of his career. So I noted Nick told two good stories today. Here's the first one, how he ran into Fran Brown coming off a train and, and how a relationship was built. Man, it was like deja vu because I met him in um, getting off the, the train in Atlanta. I was getting on and he was getting off. And I was like, man, I recognized immediately who he was. So I walked with him for about 30 minutes and I just talked to him and said, man, you Fran Brown, I heard a lot about you. Uh, everyone says, I, I, I'm just like you. And um, he, he talked to me and he gave me some words of encouragement. And immediately after that conversation, I'm like, man, this dude's going to be a head coach. He was just special. You could just feel it, his energy. And uh, I, wrote it, I wrote it down on my short-term and long-term goals. I wanted to work for him, just like I want to work for Coach E one day when he's a head coach. But uh, it's crazy, two, two years later, he gave me a call and it was like, wow. You know, I kind of manifested it. And um, I look up to those guys. I admire them, especially coming from where they come from. Uh, and to, then to accomplish what they've accomplished, it's pretty remarkable. It really is, Emily. And look, there's 130 or so Division One football programs. Coaching staffs have 10 coaches, but then there's strength coaches and all the staff that's there. We've certainly seen an increase at Syracuse there. So as big as that sounds when you do the math, the coaching world is a small world, right? These They see each other on the road. They see each other recruiting. They see each other at the coaching conventions when they go to the national championship weekend. So to meet Fran Brown in that way, and then it, Nick said it, to almost manifest this relationship that's there, it does show you that it, it is a, a smaller world than I guess we think it is. Yeah, I had heard that story from Nick when I chatted with him in the off season and, and got a little one-on-one -on -one time. And, you know, it, it's crazy because he also has similar stories with Robinson and then Dion Sanders, mm -hmm. who he worked under at Colorado on, on Dion's inaugural staff. And um, not to spoil too much, you can read it on the site. I feel like I've said that four times today, but you can. Plug away, <laughs> um, baby. Plug away. His, he, he met Dion while Dion's sons were being recruited at, I believe, Georgia. I believe this was when Williams was like a grad assistant at Georgia or student assistant. And he was like tasked with getting them back from an on-campus party to their hotel or like whatever they had been doing that night. And Dion came down and like thanked him and was like, I'm going to remember you and was just so impressed by how Williams was working as a student assistant. And two to three years later, Dion gave him a call and was like, come work for me. And so like this has happened for multiple times. And, and like you said, he's he's a great anecdote teller so when he tells a story like you get you get a good amount of detail and it's fun to hear speaking of which one last from uh nick williams here where your references uh, coach prime being disciplined and affecting the quarterback now we got to stop the we got to strike blockers and stop the run that's that's number one but uh affecting the quarterback and getting sacks and putting pressure on on that guy standing back there and i think that's been the, the main focus and the, these guys have embraced it we got really good players fidel diggs is a phenomenal leader um, and guys are coming along, Chase and Dennis and Hastings and even the young guys, uh, King and Jihad. Um, I'm really happy. And David O. We're all just holding each other to a standard. And they're holding me to a standard. Um, they know I, I love what I do. I'm really passionate about it. And I, one thing I learned, um, one thing Coach Prime told me one time that stuck with me is, your guys are going to act just like you. They're going to reciprocate your personality. So... Um, this is all I got. This is all I can do is coach ball and be around these young guys. So I take advantage of every day, and I'm extremely blessed when I wake up in the morning, and I take advantage. I don't let a day slip, and I'm going to give it my all. And that's what the edge guys are giving me. They're giving me their all. That's all I can ask. So can I just say this before we hear from Fran Brown in a couple of clips here? Again, how refreshing it is to hear from these assistant coaches, to hear their stories, where they come from, and why, what their philosophies are. And, you know, everything's fine. You know, the world still spins hearing from assistant coaches, fans especially like to know who they're investing in, who they're rooting for, where it comes from. And every coach we've talked to so far, Emily, and look, it's, it's, we're still in the honeymoon phase here, right? But they've all had good stories to tell. And mm -hmm. to hear, you like to hear why, you know, the, why Nick Williams 
came to work for, uh, work for Fran Brown, pardon me, as opposed to some of the other coaches, they all had heard about Fran and had connections to Fran, but the path is different. And it's just really interesting to hear that. And Williams' background, as you brought up with Coach Prime before, and just he's just a really interesting guy, 33 years old, to be in this position here and talk about his family and how happy his wife is. Like People want to hear this stuff, and they want to relate to these coaches they're investing so much time in. And it's just, I walk away from all of these just refreshed that they get to tell these stories and we get to hear them. Right. And you know what? I It's not the case for every assistant coach, but plenty that I've talked to appreciate the chance to get to share their stories with us too and mm-hmm. talk to us and explain personnel choices and, and be able to talk through things. And so it, it's definitely like a mutual, mutually beneficial relationship there for the most part. And obviously, like you said, it's it's the honeymoon phase right now where we're just kind of getting to know each other. But um, yeah, it, it's been really refreshing. All right, let's hear from Fran Brown as, as we continue to get to know him as a head coach here. And uh, shout out to him, by the way. I don't think it's going to be the case for every injury report, but as we noted earlier, we asked him about injuries. There was no upper or lower body injury or vagueness. It was <laughs> hairline fracture, surgery, all these terms that we heard because he saw no reason to hide any of that. We'll see if that's the case during the season. Football coaches are football coaches after all. But you guys want to know how the scrimmage went. Here's what Fran Brown saw in the scrimmage on Saturday. Kyle, Kyle did a really good job. I thought he was on point. He uh, got the guys to play. Um, I think he has to be able to get them to maintain that through the entire game, though. They played for him early on. You could see it. And as we got in the situation of football, uh, you know, we, think we thought we gave up a little bit too many sacks. You know, but um, I thought Kyle did a good job. I think uh, – young guy uh joe cruz he did a good job stepping up on the offensive line just seeing guys like himself um of course a couple of young wideouts are doing a good job um Yazzie haynes uh gill stepping up just watching him do things and then seeing that we can run the football you know i think we'll have an opportunity of being able to run the ball so those guys did good on the defense um digs of course he could play and just being able to see uh young marcellus marcellus did a good job our safeties i'm Pretty cool. I feel good about JB and Deuce and uh, Cinco. You know, just feel pretty good about those guys, what they're doing. They've been able to lead. So just trying to figure the rest out. But I just seen some guys make plays, but then you seen them kind of low off. You know, we just talk about second parts of it. To us, this is the second half of spring ball. You know, we did, uh, what, practice eight today. So it's like our second half, similar to the season, being able to go. You know, we've had a history of starting off fast and then not finish. So we'll see what they do now. Two things in there, Emily. One, Fran is well aware of the history he's walking into that Syracuse has faded in the second half of the season due to injury. Somewhat other reasons went into that, certainly, but that was a made ingredient in that. And yet another reference of Marcellus Barnes Jr., freshman who comes in, highly rated recruit, who sounds like he is. He is pushing for playing time and is somebody that's popping out there. Right. I mean, you definitely have to think at least at, at this point, obviously there are more freshmen coming in the summer who who could be impact guys. Mm-hmm. But as it stands, Marcellus is kind of the shoe. And I think for true freshmen who could get significant playing time in the fall. Um, but yeah, that that last part of that quote that, that you started off with um, in your comments, like that, that's also what resonated with me about him recognizing that this has been a pattern in the past for Syracuse, because I think so often when new coaching staffs come in, you you hear like, oh, well, that's the past and we're it's going to be different now and we're going to we're doing things different. So it's not going to be the same. And I that what happened last year, what happened two years ago doesn't matter to me. But like the truth of the matter is you're working with largely the same personnel. And like, obviously, there's been a decent chunk of turnover this year, but you're working with the same personnel that was around for the past yeah. two years, up to up to four years with some of these guys who are older. Um, and so there are things that have been problems in past years that could still pop up and are worth mentioning and bringing up. And, and you know, obviously it it is going to be different just because it's, it's Fran and it's different. But like that doesn't mean that like everything is just going to be smooth sailing in the second half of the season, like like brand new and, and everything's good to go. So I thought that was really interesting and, and kind of just shows – how seriously he's taking this whole thing. Like he, he is acknowledging what the problems have been for this group in the past and, and both on and off the field. Cause we all know about 
some of the problems or purported problems with the alumni relations and stuff like that. And that's obviously been a focus. So yeah, I, I thought that was really interesting. Yeah, that's a great point. A couple more from Fran Brown here. Emily, we've heard so much about DART, detailed, accountable, relentless, and tough, right? Well, Fran put out a, a new philosophy today. You got to always do what's best for the S first, which is Syracuse, then the player, then the coaching staff. So, you know, the best thing for Syracuse as a university, alumni, just fans, was to get him to go get right so then that way they can see some a nice player on the field come September instead of prolonging and then, you know, things linger along, you know. That came from Fran talking about the Aranda Gatson and Jackson Meeks injury, about thinking about long-term, big-term. It doesn't benefit you to be out there right now. We need you healthy when it matters in September. So let's get those things taken care of now. And, you know, one injury is a little bit more of a longer process in recovery than the other, as we brought up earlier. But uh, that that was a a new one from Fran. We're starting to get all these philosophies and and expressions here, uh, Dart being the main one, but there's another one right there. A uh, couple weeks to go in camp here as we bear down. We're, what, 11 days away from the spring game on April 20th. Here's what Fran wants to see down the stretch from his team. I just want to be able to line up and run power over and over again. And you know that we're running the ball and you can't stop it. That's what that looks like to me. And they know we're running it and they're running the blitz to it. And we still run it over and over again. Like, to me, that's when you'll be mentally and physically tough. You know, or if it's in the fourth quarter and we can run for 100 yards in the fourth quarter just because we can run the football and we're tough and the line wants to run behind them. You know, that's kind of what it looks like to me. But we'll get, a, we'll get the second half of spring ball and then summer workout. You know, that's where we really build that up. That's where we find out who's what. When he was asked initially about it, Emily, he said toughness. This team's got to be tougher. That includes the coaching staff. That includes myself. That includes the players. So right to the end here with uh, 11 days to the spring game, he's he's really emphasizing that. And I, and I feel like the the pace of practice, the energy of practice, which almost every player we've talked to has noted that, the strength and conditioning program is, is tougher, is harder. But one thing I've really – taken from that and I wonder if you've seen the same Emily or maybe something that I'm not bringing up here is the players like it right we hear so much about this you can't challenge the younger generation as much as you used to I mean that that's obviously not the case because this team and these guys have have really embraced it it's like when you start a new workout program for the first week it stinks because you're sore and you're like why am I doing this but once you kind of get used to it you're like yeah I'm feeling better this is good and 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 I like that he's leaning on us a little harder and being more direct as well. Right. I mean, a great example is as, as we were leaving practice today, you and I noted how frenetic the uh, special teams drills are. (laughs) Like practice in general is, is very up tempo and loud, but when they get out there to run the field goals, like it's like all, all hell breaks loose, but like (laughs) it's planned that way. Yes. And it's funny because we don't really get a watch because that's when we're being escorted out, but we kind of like catch glances over our shoulders and are turning around and stuff. But you asked punter Jack Stonehouse about that and he immediately like broke out into a smile talking about it. So it's certainly the players like how up tempo and fast and intense and competitive and all of those adjectives, um, how, how much of practice has been like that. You said another word too, and it's ironic because what we heard about Dino Babers coming in, and for a while it was, was how fast practice would go and Orange is the new fast. This These practices have been faster, but that word, louder. The, yeah. the, the coaches and the players pick up on it too. It's literally louder because Fran has the microphone he turns on sometimes. I put some video on Twitter if you guys want to hear Fran Brown doing live color commentary about what he's coaching and then the whole practice gets to hear it. So these guys know, like I'm going to get called out here, not just by a coach in an individual group, but my head coach is going to tell everybody at times what is happening there. But yeah, it's just louder. There is more energy. There is a a stronger pace to it. And and this is just the 25 minutes or so we get to watch let alone uh, what we don't get to see, just what we get to hear about. And again, we're heading towards a, a spring game that, could actually replicate and look like a game more than we've seen uh, in a while here, for sure. So, Emily, our next pod is going to be Thursday. We are going to get the chance to talk to Ross Douglas then, who comes to Syracuse from the New England Patriots in the National Football League. So it'll be interesting to get a broad view of the wide receivers, but it's going to be mailbag time. We are going to do pretty much the entire pod, aside from things we see at practice on Thursday and who we get to talk to on Thursday, 
from your questions. So this is where our Syracuse Sports Insiders get to step in here. Text the word ORANGE to 315-847-3895 if you haven't already to become a Syracuse Sports Insider so you can send us your questions about Syracuse football, about the transfer portal in college basketball, about lacrosse, anything going on in Orange sports that you want to know about, send it to us. But for this mailbag, we've already got a few in the bank here, but anything you want to know about what we've seen at practice so far, what we're going to see about Syracuse football in general, send us your questions, and Emily and I are going to dedicate most of Thursday's podcast to your questions about this team, your thoughts about this team as well so all of our syracuse sports insiders already signed up make sure you send us your questions and if you haven't signed up yet it's a two-week free trial and it's just 3.99 a month after that Uh, today for example walked off the field saw that jackson meeks was in a boo that's new our syracuse sports insiders knew that first thing when we walked off the practice field so sign up today to be a syracuse sports insider and thursday's pod should be a lot of fun Emily, uh, final thoughts here before we go. How was your view of the eclipse <laughs> earlier this week? I know you were high atop the Syracuse.com media headquarters. Yeah, you know, it was it was fine. Everyone was dealing with clouds, right? So yeah. we, we had a couple glimpses. It's funny because they, they make the glasses, right, pitch black. So you're yes. protecting your eyes. But with the clouds and the glasses on, you couldn't see anything. No. So I, I, I will admit now that it's over, I did sneak one glance with my raw <laughs> eyes and then spent the rest of the afternoon being like, should I have done that? But, uh, <laughs> the eyes are fine. Um, I thought it was really cool, you know, seeing everything go dark and watching kind of the street lights come on in, in the city um, where the newsroom is downtown. We have a pretty good view of, of everything and can look around. And it was just fun, too, to see people out enjoying it and and taking time off work and having a beer and just laying back in the grass and stuff like that. It, it's one of those moments where like humanity felt all right. Like I think most of the time these days, like humanity can feel really <laughs> frustrating. Um, and it was just nice to see like in person, but then also online, like everyone kind of just sharing a little bit of like childlike wonder for this kind of crazy, weird, spectacular well celestial event. <laughs> Well said. And that was the part I didn't really expect that people didn't really, there was so much focus on what it would look like in terms of just mm-hmm. the, the, the moon and the sun intersecting. The fact that it got, it gets dark every night, obviously, but it's a gradual <laughs> process for it to be light, even on a cloudy day, dark for five minutes and light again was just creepy. It was like a Ghostbusters mm-hmm. movie or something, right? So that experience was cool, but yeah, I may have snuck in a look or two without the glasses, but it was cloudy. So what does that mean? We'll see. We'll just, uh, you know, see how the eyes are feeling going forward here. But once in a lifetime event here in central New York, and of course it had to be cloudy, but everybody snuck in a view at some point. I saw, uh, well, about this? Some guy uh, proposed to his mm-hmm. girlfriend at one of the local central New York events. I mean, that's better than doing it at like a baseball game or something. Well done, right. buddy. Way to go on that. And like you said, everybody just for five minutes just kind of took a deep breath and said, yeah, pretty cool, this world we live mm-hmm. in sometimes. We need some more of those events to come along here. Like yeah. Syracuse football, for example, the spring <laughs> game. We'll all unite there on the 20th. Mm-hmm. Until then, Emily and I will be on it for you. Check out all her great stuff on Syracuse.com. Our pod Thursday is going to be dedicated to your questions, so we're looking forward to that and continuing to track Syracuse football here. For the meantime, Emily Liker, Brent Dax, Syracuse Sports. It's presented by Krause Health, the exclusive healthcare partner for SU Athletics, and we'll talk to you next time, guys.